Hi everybody, I'm Becca with Free Tours by Foot. We're gonna be kicking off our tour guide Tuesday live stream, Facebook chat. In just a few minutes, I'm gonna give everyone a chance to uh, join in. Uh, so hi, I'm Becca. We're gonna make sure this is working. Uh, this is the first time we've ever done this. I'm a total guinea pig for this endeavor. So um, I'm set up, but I also have my computer here so that I can try to see everybody's comments in real time. I'm gonna do my best to answer everyone's questions. So uh, I hope you'll be patient with me. We'll also keep this up on our Facebook page uh, so you'll be able to come back and watch it and see what we've been talking about. So um, hi, I'm gonna give everyone a minute to log in, say hello. All right, so uh, I've got my stream up over here, so I'm gonna try to watch everybody's questions as they come in. Um, a little bit about me. Uh, my name's Becca, I'm from Houston, Texas, originally born and raised. I went to college in Virginia at Randolph-Macon Women's College. Um, my original kind of career background was in museum education. I was an American culture major, so I've always loved American history, and I love the way it connects to art, literature, politics, society, um, so I got a really good interdisciplinary education and it fed right into public history. Uh, I've been a tour guide for eight years. Uh, a lot of people ask me how I became a tour guide. That's like the number one question I get asked. Um, I came around to it maybe in a bit of a roundabout way. Uh, I was living in Washington, DC. I was working a museum related job and my dad came to visit. And like a lot of uh, folks in our area, when your parents are visiting, you wanna show them the sites. So I took my dad on a Lincoln assassination tour with DC by foot, which I had just found on the internet. I'm a huge Lincoln buff. I'm sure we will talk about Lincoln a lot during this tour. Um, excellent, sorry. Uh, I'm sure we'll talk about Lincoln a lot during this tour, during this chat. Um, so we did the Lincoln assassination tour. We loved it, it was so great. And our guide was Rich, who was one of the owners of DC by Foot. And at the end of the tour, he gave me some great information, mentioned that they were always looking for guides. And here we are eight years later. Uh, tour guiding is by far the best job I've ever had. I love meeting people from all across the country, all around the world. I love sharing history. I love sharing the city of DC. Um, I love uh, learning about DC and our history. Um, so it's a really, really great job. I'm very excited. <laughs> um, if you take a look in the comments, uh, you'll see one of our other guides, Rebecca, uh, commenting in that she has like basically the same tour guide uh, story that I do. So um, that said, Lincoln Assassination is, I think, one of our best tours, and I'm sure it will come up a lot. Let's see who else is viewing. Hi to all our other viewers. Be sure to say hello and where you're from uh, down in the comments so I can see where everybody's coming in from. Um, a little bit about free tours by foot in general. Free tours by foot uh, is a primarily walking tour uh, company. We do tours all around the United States and in Europe. So we're not just in DC, we're all over. Um, two tours that I have taken with free tours by foot, not in DC that I love, that I definitely wanted to share with everybody. The first was a Bushwick street art tour in Brooklyn, New York. Uh, my husband and I took that tour last summer with Mar. Uh, that was amazing. I know a lot about American history. I know nothing about street art and Mar is not just a tour guide he's an artist so I learned so much about street art the culture we got incredible pictures we went to um, a part of Brooklyn that I wasn't as familiar with um, so that's one of my all-time most favorite tours that our company does period uh, and I would recommend that to everybody when it's safe to go back out another free tours by foot tour that I did that I really loved uh, with my family is and we were in London two years ago and we did the Harry Potter tour now if you love the books if you love the movies this tour is incredible. You basically walk through London and see all the sites from the movie, from the books, um, and you learn a lot about British history in London itself. We saw all the major landmarks on the Harry Potter tour. So those are two examples of the kinds of tours we do. But what's great about every city is we use local guides. So we write and create tours that are really unique to our interests and to what's special about the city. Um, so those are two tours I would recommend. In addition to that, though, we work with all kinds of people. So our guides are working with corporate groups. We work with business groups. We work with student groups. Uh, young people is a huge part of our business. And so I think I can speak for most 
sales guides saying that a big perk of our job is getting to work with a lot of different audiences. Um, so that's just a little bit about me, a little bit about the company. Hi, Candon, Matt, um, Monisha, and kids, hi. Uh, Chris from New York is watching, very, very cool. Uh, don't forget, you guys can put any questions you have. We've got plenty of time on this chat this afternoon. So if you have questions about what it's like to be a tour guide, if you have questions about what we do, if you have questions about DC, American history, any of it. Um, I did have a few people send in some que questions before the chat began, so I'll try to sprinkle some of those in. I see a few more people joining in. Hi, Stan, hi, Stan. Stan, Stan, I hope I'm pronouncing that. Uh, correctly. Um, I know we have a lot of people watching from the East Coast in DC, um, but are on the East Coast of the US, but I'd love to see where everyone else is watching from. Uh, one question I got uh, almost immediately is from my friend Christy in Texas. Uh, she wanted to know uh, what my favorite monument in DC is, which I think is a really great question. Hi, Manuel from New York City. Uh, you should go check out our street art tour. So my favorite memorial monument in Washington, D.C. Um, is such a hard question. It's like asking who your favorite child is or whatever. Um, I think for me, and this is going to seem so obvious, it's the Lincoln Memorial. That's my favorite major site. Uh, I never get over it. I never get over the grandeur of the memorial, the beauty of the memorial, and what the memorial represents. Uh, that memorial for me isn't just about link in the individual it's about the nation we go through this incredible trial of the civil war we're divided in two we fight for long years we finally sort of reconcile and end the practice of slavery in the united states and then just as we're coming back together we have the first american president killed in a political assassination and that sort of reconciliation the coming back together the idea of e pluribus unum out of many one is so beautifully represented in that memorial so it always takes my breath away it's always a memorial I love to share and then you go inside and you have Lincoln this incredible president this incredible man uh, represented so dynamically um, inside that memorial uh, and then of course inside the two texts the Gettysburg Address which I'm sure many of you uh, have studied I had to memorize it in school I'm sure students still have to do that today and then on the opposite wall you've got that second inaugural address which I think is the most beautiful piece of writing that Lincoln pens in his lifetime. Uh, when Lincoln is talking about uh, this war, when he's talking about the beginning of his second term, just five weeks before his assassination, and he's talking about binding up the nation's wounds, he says, with malice towards none and charity towards all, um, I am just always moved at the Lincoln Memorial. Uh, I see a few of you also agree with me about the Lincoln Memorial. It is a fan favorite. Oh, hi, Maggie. Hi, Mel. Uh, excellent, excellent. Um, oh, someone mentioned the Vietnam Veterans Memorial. Uh, I think when it comes to war memorials, the Vietnam Veterans Memorial is my favorite. It is incredibly moving. Uh, the simplicity of it is so remarkable. It is a memorial where people have a very personal experience when visiting and uh, I have never had a visit to the Vietnam Memorial be the same because it's different every time depending on who's there, depending on their connection to the wall. Um, I find it particularly moving around the holidays when you're there close to Father's Day or Christmas or <laughs> Memorial Day and there's so many people and there's all those items that people leave at the wall. Um, it's so personal and moving. Um, if you are interested in seeing any of these virtually, we're going to be posting up a lot of great virtual tours over the next couple of weeks. So we're putting up a lot of video, including some 360 video. So I know I'm talking about stuff from my house, but um, we're gonna put a lot of content up over the next couple of weeks. Uh, I think Rebecca asked what my favorite like minor site or more like less known site in DC is. I am, and this sort of goes to a question too, Linda asked about kind of a little more DC related sites. I'm really into cemeteries right now and two cemeteries in DC that I love that I really think are great for locals and visitors alike are Oak Hill Cemetery in Georgetown and Congressional Cemetery up sort of east of Capitol Hill. So I know that um, a lot of you watching have probably heard or been to both of those places, um, but they both really dig into not just American history, um, but into DC local history as well. Oak Hill Cemetery in Georgetown was founded in 1848. It's sort of a country club uh, for the elite in Washington, particularly in Georgetown. Uh, one of my favorite figures from history, uh, Secretary of War Edwin Stanton, uh, Secretary of War under Lincoln, Edwin Stanton, 
Stanton is buried there. I love Stanton. He's fascinating. Um, uh, ben Bradley and uh, Catherine and Philip Graham from the Washington Post are buried there. Um, <laughs> a lot of, I have a lot of like Lincoln related people. Freddie Aiken, uh, who was the lawyer who defended Mary Surratt, is buried there. If you've seen The Conspirator, um, the movie, James McAvoy plays Aiken. Um, I think most famously, though, Oak Hill is known for being the place that Willie Lincoln was interred um, from the time he died in 1862 until President Lincoln's death in 1865. So uh, Oak Hill is one I really recommend. Congressional Cemetery, I think, skews even more local. Um, I know that there are tour guides listening in who uh, are listening into the chat right now who know way more about Congressional Cemetery than I do. Um, but I love that there are so many amazing figures who are buried there, particularly related to women's history. Two women that I really love and I love talking about on my tours are Belle the Lockwood and um, Adelaide Johnson, the sculptor, and both of them are buried at Congressional. Um, the team at Congressional, they do great online resources. They do great tours. So that's a tip, I think, for locals. Ah, yeah, Caitlin, Belle the Lockwood. All right, let me just make sure I'm hitting everybody. Um, hi, Rachel from England. That's awesome. Uh, we're in England. Uh, Mel was asking, where is John Wilkes Booth buried? That's a really good question. His He's buried in Maryland, um, but you're not going to find a marked grave site. So he's buried in an unmarked grave. Oh, Emmanuel mentioned our Brooklyn Bridge tour. Um, this is one of my favorite just general travel tips. Uh, everyone says to walk the Brooklyn Bridge, do it. It might feel touristy, it might feel silly, but it is an incredible experience. Walking the Brooklyn Bridge, either on your own or with a tour, I would highly recommend. Um, it's just so cool to see both the Brooklyn skyline and the Manhattan skyline from that bridge. It's such a feat of engineering, um, so I would highly recommend that. Oh my gosh, we're covering a lot of ground. I want to make sure I've got everyone's questions. Oh, oh, Mel asks, which tours do you do and which one is your favorite to do? So I do pretty much every tour in our rotation. Um, I'm definitely, I think at a point being a guide for eight years where I'm often uh, working with our team in DC to help develop and create new tours. So I do all of our tours. That's the National Mall, uh, the Tidal Basin, that's Cherry Blossoms, which we would normally be doing this year. Uh, we did post a virtual Cherry Blossom tour on our Facebook page. So if you're missing the blossoms, like I think we all are, uh, please check that out we tried to get you guys some great footage uh, as safely as we could so that everyone could enjoy the bloom. I do the Lincoln assassination tour. Uh, I do our Georgetown tour, which I love. Uh, Georgetown's the oldest part of Washington, D.C. It has great history and it's beautiful. Um, so I love spending time in Georgetown. Uh, I do our Capitol Hill tour. And uh, with uh, my colleague and good friend, Aaron, we developed a Capitol Hill scandals tour that was going to really roll out this spring. So as soon as we're able to, we're really excited to uh, get our Capitol Hill Scandals tour going. Just adjust a little bit. Uh, what other tours? We do so many tours. Arlington National Cemetery is one of my favorite tours to do. My grandparents and great-grandparents are buried at Arlington, so it's very special to me. Um, but I love sharing Arlington Cemetery. Arlington is our most hallowed ground. Over 400,000 uh, of our America's heroes and their family members are laid to rest there. Um, so I just find it really uh, moving and incredible. Um, if you haven't been following our DC by Foot Facebook page, we've been sharing updates from the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier at Arlington National Cemetery. Even though the cemetery is closed to the public, they're still uh, keeping their funeral schedule as of, as of right now. And those uh, tomb, uh, the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier, the Sentinels are still there. They're still standing posts, they're guarding. Um, so it's really incredible to see even in times of crisis or times of, of difficulty, um, they keep that watch. They're always there. Really incredible. So hi to Marsha from Charleston. Hi. We have great tours in Charleston. Scott, um, one of our guides in Charleston, is incredible. Um, we get just emails and emails and emails about his tours in Charleston. So that is on my to-do list next time we go down there is to take one of Scott's tours. Uh, Rob from Maine. Hey, Rob. Uh, Rob actually asked a really good question uh, before the chat about what's my favorite like gory or odd or ghosty story, um, which is hard because I have a lot of really good ones. Uh, on my Capitol Hill scandals, I do my top five favorite deaths in the Capitol because people have died there, y'all. It's just true. Uh, <laughs> but I think maybe for this chat, I'll make a mention of a man who was requested earlier, uh, Daniel Sickles. I won't go in depth 
with Daniel Sickles because this is a family friendly chat today and we're probably going to talk about sickles on our new should have asked a tour guide podcast coming up so I imagine I'm going to get a lot of sickles talk in there soon but Daniel Sickles, in terms of gory and odd, uh, is maybe best remembered today by Civil War uh, aficionados for being the man who had his leg blown off during the Battle of Gettysburg. Uh, Sickles was uh, a little foolish in battle sometimes. He got caught up in wanting to be a hero, being sort of this brave figure, and he was not one for following orders. And so he completely neglects the, meat of the orders of General Meade. He's gonna lead his men into the peach orchard instead of staying at the Round Tops where he should have stayed and he's gonna get hit um, with a cannonball. They're gonna amputate his leg at uh, the knee down, and he's going to keep that leg bone for the rest of his life. Uh, when he learns that the army is collecting medical specimens from the war, he wraps it up in a box and he sends it uh, to uh, the army for the new Army Medical Museum. Now, uh, they say that he had a little condition um, for the leg, which is that he could visit it uh, every July 2nd, the anniversary of when the leg was amputated from him. So I like to keep a tradition every summer when I can. July 2nd, I go to visit the leg because it's on display at the National Museum of Health and Medicine. That's uh, in Silver Spring, Maryland, uh, close to Walter Reed. It's a free museum. It's got incredible exhibits about military medical history, some very cool things related to our presidents. That's where the bullet that killed Lincoln is on display, but you can see Sickles' leg with a cannonball like the one that took it off. So um, I think that's maybe my favorite little gory piece of history uh, that I talk about. And we can talk more about sickles on our podcast. So um, I know people have been curious about what we're doing as tour guides while we can't be out leading tours. So we're doing things like this, this chat where we can hopefully answer your questions, get to know our community a little bit uh, better. But we're also doing a ton of virtual tours. A lot of us went out and recorded tours while it was still safe to do so. Um, so we we're going to be posting up content every day from sites, not just in D.C., but Philadelphia, Boston, New York. Uh, we had a great uh, virtual tour from Philly posted just the other day with our guide, Jen, who's incredible. We're also going to be putting up a lot of 360 footage so you can really experience these places long distance. Uh, we're launching our podcast. We dropped the trailer for that the other day. Um, the podcast will let us get a little bit more into some of the uh, the darker side of history, uh, a little bit more about what it's really like out in the field in our biz. Uh, and then, of course, we're doing gift certificates. So if you know you're going to want to come out and travel with us eventually in any of our cities, we've got gift certificates going. And we'll put links to all of this at the end of the chat. So let's see. <laughs> I, yeah, Mel, I am totally tour guide nerds unite. I will go visit the goofiest, dopiest, silliest things. Um, my poor husband, anytime we travel, it's always about finding the weird little bits of history for me. Cause that's what I love. Like show me a leg, show me, show me a, a tumor that was cut out of somebody. Show me something gross. I'm, I'm here for it. Excellent. Oh, yeah. And the bullet that killed Lincoln. Um, that to me is is incredible. Let's see who else. Excellent. Oh, hey, Lori from Jersey. Uh, Jersey in the house. All right. Cassie's got a good question. Can you talk a little bit about the earliest history of D.C. and what buildings remain from that era? So when we're talking about Washington, D.C. and its early history, we really have to go back to Georgetown. Georgetown's the oldest part of the city. Uh, they're fond of saying that before there was a Washington, there was a Georgetown. Georgetown was a thriving tobacco port long before uh, the American Revolution, before we became our own nation, and before uh, the District of Columbia was established in 1790 by an act of Congress. So to find the oldest structures in Washington, D.C., uh, you're going to want to be going to Georgetown because we have buildings there that date to the 1790s, the 1800s. The oldest um, building in Washington, D.C. on its original foundation in its original location is the Old Stone House. That's located on M Street. It uh, dates to 1766. Um, it's an incredibly cool building. It's part of the National Park Service today, so it's free to visit. Um, if you are interested in ghost history, it's said to be the most haunted building in Georgetown. There's some really fun related ghost stories with the old stone house, um, but that would be the oldest building, uh, kind of original building on its original foundation location. Now, if we're talking about oldest government buildings, well, that's the White House and the Capitol building. So when George Washington is tasked by Congress with creating a new federal district, he's given 10 
10 years and zero dollars to basically create a real city from scratch. Most of the land that Washington selected to make up the new federal district was undeveloped. That was why he wanted the land because it was kind of a blank canvas. So um, of course, when you're planning a new nation's capital, you need somewhere for the legislature to meet. Uh, that's article one of our constitution. That's kind of the backbone of our federal government. And then you're gonna need somewhere for the president to live and work. Now, if you're down on the National Mall, there's another building that's quite historic, but sometimes is surprising to people or they're not used to seeing it or when they see it, they're not sure what it is. It's the Lock Keeper's House. So this is at 17th Street Northwest and Constitution Avenue Northwest. It's a little stone building. It's actually the oldest structure on the National Mall. It dates to the 1830s. And it goes back to this era of DC, uh, the early 1800s, when we were a city that was growing. In fact, city might be a stretch. We were kind of a town uh, and we had a canal that was running through the city. So the lock keeper's house was located right along the canal to control the flow of goods and boats into that canal. And of course the lock keeper had to operate the canal, keep the records, collect tariffs, all that good stuff. Um, so the lock keeper's house is actually the oldest building on the National Mall, so older than any of our memorials or monuments. So um, hopefully that gave you a little bit of what you were looking for in terms of an answer. Hi, Anne-Marie. Um, I love everybody watching. Anne-Marie, I don't know if you're watching from DC. Are you watching from DC? Hi. Um, thank you guys so much so far. If, I, if I'm missing your question, please feel free to repost it. I want to make sure that I get to everyone's questions uh, and I cover the topics you guys want to hear. Um, I did get a great question from Fred. Uh, Fred is my uncle. Uh, my uncle Fred sent in a great question wanting to ask a little bit about the cherry blossoms. Uh, again, we posted um, a virtual cherry blossom tour that features myself and uh, Dan and Rebecca, two of our other amazing DC guides uh, that goes in depth on the cherry blossoms gives you a little bit of the history, the bloom, um, some fun stories, and it has a lot of great footage. But just as a little overview about our cherry blossoms because it is that time of year. Our cherry blossoms were a gift uh, from the Japanese, um, but it's a gift that sort of comes about thanks to the work of a woman named Eliza Skidmore. Skidmore um, was a woman really ahead of her time. She was well-traveled. She was a founding member of National Geographic. She was um, a woman who traveled and wrote, um, and she just knew, she knew that Washington, D.C. would be a good home for cherry blossoms, and she just pursues this for 20 years, eventually gets a letter into the hands of uh, Helen Taft, uh, Helen Nellie Taft, uh, first lady wife of William Howard Taft um, and that's where it sort of happens uh, they're able to sort of connect and convince the Japanese to donate uh, a gift of trees the original gift that arrives is infested so it has to be burned you can imagine diplomatically that was not ideal luckily we were able to secure a second gift and in 1912 over 3,000 trees were sent to Washington DC Helen Taft selected the tidal basin down along the National Mall as kind of the ideal planning site for a majority of the trees. At the time, there was the basin and a driving path, but there weren't any memorials or monuments. So she saw the trees as creating this really beautiful public park. Uh, she said every spring it would be a sea of cherry when they're in bloom. Now, um, the thing about cherry blossom trees, and you would know this if you watch our virtual tour, is they actually are really delicate and they don't live a long time, uh, especially when you have millions of people coming out to see them every year. And so in 1965, we were lucky to get a second gift uh, that was presented to First Lady, uh, Lady Bird Johnson. So um, a second gift of another set of 3,000 trees were given to us in 1965. Um, Lady Bird Johnson helped to negotiate that um, to help replenish uh, our cherry blossom trees. I love cherry blossom season. I know that perhaps um, for some locals or some guides, it can be stressful because you get uh, millions of people coming down in one week to visit the trees. But I find it incredibly beautiful. It's it's the beauty of the trees, but everybody comes together. It's always the first sign of spring. So I always find that really exciting. So let's see, this is my first, this is our first chat. So um, I don't know how I'm doing so far, but if you have any questions about what it's like to be a tour guide, what we do in our city or other cities, if you're curious about anything about DC, uh, anything about American history, I'm happy to um, gently assist you with your homework. If you have uh, some home homework you're doing on American history right now, some distance learning, uh, I'm happy to be a resource. So let's see how, how we're doing, how we're going. I think I've tackled a lot of the questions that people sent in in advance. <laughs> um, yes, Rebecca noted that I am a Taft 
truther. So let's just let's just put it out on the table. I love William Howard Taft. I think William Howard Taft is a fascinating person. He was a man, I think, ahead of his time. Um, <laughs> so I find him really interesting. He's, of course, the first president to have a car at the White House. He's the first president to work out of the Oval Office in the West Wing. He's the first president to be buried at Arlington National Cemetery. First president to throw out a ceremonial first pitch at a baseball game, uh, which I love because I love baseball. Uh, he's the only person in our history to be president and chief justice of the United States Supreme Court. He's the man who advocates for the creation of a separate building for the Supreme Court. So we get the Supreme Court building because of Taft and he's one of the driving forces in the completion of the Lincoln Memorial. So Taft is a really important figure. Unfortunately, all those things I listed is not what people ever want to hear about Taft. Uh, people always ask me if it's true that he got stuck in a bathtub in the White House. No. No, it's not true. Um, Taft was a big dude. He was a big guy. Um, he was uh, clocked in over 300. Um, he was a big, burly guy of that era. Um, but he never got stuck in a bathtub. Uh, I think this comes out of the fact that he had a custom tub made, a vastly oversized tub, uh, big enough to fit four grown men. That's He wasn't the size of four grown men. He just had an oversized tub put in. Uh, he did overflow the bathtub in the White House once, though, causing quite a mess and quite a, quite a trouble. Uh, I always felt bad for Taft though because he sort of knew um, that it was a bit of a, a discomfort maybe to overflow that tub because one time he was traveling on the East Coast uh, somewhere off the coast in New Jersey and he looked out at the Atlantic and he told one of his aides that someday he could just rope off a little bit of the ocean and use it as his bathtub and he would never overflow it. Now, this is the other thing a lot of people don't know about Taft is that when he becomes Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, he actually implements a whole exercise routine. He starts consulting with a nutritionist in London, basically does an early version of like counting calories and portion control, and then he just starts walking to work every day and he loses 100 pounds in his lifetime. So if you need some quarantine motivation on um, keeping keeping healthy, let's we can use Taft. Uh, okay, let's see. Oh, hi. Hi, Lori. Lori from Texas. Hi. Um, great question from Cassie. If I have one day in D.C., what should I try to see? The great thing about one day in D.C. is that you can actually cover a lot. If I were to kind of structure a one day itinerary for the average traveler, I'd encourage you to go out to see the memorials in the morning. Typically, depending on the time of year and the weather. If you go out in the morning, it's gonna be less crowded than later in the day and the evenings. So um, I love to go out. If you can get out early, it's just you and the joggers. Um, you can walk the National Mall in a matter of a couple of hours, depending on your pace and your interest. So I would recommend doing that in the morning. Maybe considering going up to Capitol Hill after lunch, uh, seeing the Capitol building, the Supreme Court and the Library of Congress, they're all together, and then possibly maybe a museum. If I was only gonna do one museum, if I had one day in DC and I could only do one, I would personally go to the National Museum of American History. It's one of the Smithsonian museums. When people talk about the Smithsonian, they're talking about the largest museum complex in the world. There are 19 Smithsonian museums plus the zoo, so it can be very overwhelming. But for me, if you were to just do one, it would be American history. There's so many incredible things to see there. I love personally the Star Spangled Banner, the flag that flew at Fort McHenry, inspired Francis Scott Key to write that beautiful poem. Uh, we took that poem, set it to the tune of a British drinking song, and made it our national anthem. Uh, the flag is incredible. It's so much bigger than you ever think it's going to be. And I just love that connection to something that's now so significant, um, this, this song that we sing all the time. And that means so much to our country. I also love, of course, all the presidential stuff. You can see the hats that Lincoln was wearing that night, uh, that night of his assassination at Ford's Theater. Uh, you can see um, all sorts of items that belong to our presidents. The first lady dresses, very popular. Um, I'm also a big fan of all the pop culture stuff. So Dorothy's ruby red slippers. Uh, I love seeing the Muppets when they're on display um, and the Batmobile, which is currently down in the basement. Um, so that would be kind of my one day. Oh, and then for the evening. For the evening, I would probably go out on U Street. I love U Street. That's sort of the area I like to hang. Um, so I would probably go grab drinks, uh, a bite to eat, maybe a stop at Ben's Chili Bowl if it's your first time to DC. I would also maybe recommend for the evening, the wharf. I love the wharf area, kind of on the southwestern part of DC. Uh, I love being out on the water. If you like tiki bars, I'm a fan of tiki TNT. But if you like seafood, the wharf has a lot of great options. So that's my quick hit on a one day DC itinerary. Uh, Chris from New York says, what's the best time of year to visit DC if someone doesn't like big crowds? Right now. 
No, I'm just kidding. Um, the best time of year, honestly, um, if you want to avoid crowds, normally I would say avoid the spring, avoid the summer. Um, usually winter, winter is a good time. Uh, January, February can be cold here, um, but we usually don't get the heavy snow that you get further north. Um, so it's usually still pretty temperate. Um, everything in DC for the most part is open year round. Um, there's definitely different hours and stuff if you come in the winter um, and some of the outdoor things may not be as enjoyable, but that's a good time to avoid the crowds. Uh, usually like right after Labor Day, right after Labor Day, early September is a nice quiet time. It can still be really hot in DC in September, but you're going to avoid some of the bigger crowds. I also like November if you can come just before Thanksgiving uh, or that first week of December. So um, I'm a fan of that time. Fall is really nice, but I will warn you, October, um, early November is starting to get to be busy season for tourists as well. Yeah, Taft has a nice little connection to the Lincoln Memorial. So my two favorite presidents coming together. Um, excellent. You guys are such a great crowd. Thank you for tuning in. Um, I wanted to see, let's see if I've covered everything I wanted to talk about. Do you guys have any questions? Oh, I actually, I have a question that I get asked on all my tours and actually brought a pop prop. So I've mentioned it before, but I love leading our Lincoln assassination tour. I'm a Lincoln enthusiast. Um, the Lincoln assassination tour is basically a two hour deep dive on the last 24 hours of Lincoln's life. And we look at the conspiracy, conspiracy, those involved. We look at what's happening with Lincoln, his family, his cabinet, his friends. Um, and it, it's just an incredible tour. The real life story of what happens in, in those days and the days that follow is so much better than any fiction writer could have invented. So whenever somebody takes my Lincoln assassination tour at the end, they always say, what should I read? I wanna know more, what should I read? My number one favorite book about Lincoln's assassination is Manhunt by James Swanson. Ooh. Manhunt by James Swanson. I love this book so much that I'm on like my fifth or sixth copy because I just keep loaning it out to people because uh, it's an incredible read. It's exceptionally well researched. If you are like me and you are way into footnotes, oh my gosh, it's got amazing footnotes. Um, so you can definitely get into the nitty gritty of his sourcing, but it reads very light. I know that um, a lot of the people who come on our tours come on our tours because we're trying to present history in a maybe more accessible way or easier to understand way um, or just like something that's a little more um, human connection. Um, Manhunt is a great read. It's not heavy. It's not too dense. Um, this is really, really good. If you are looking to maybe for something that might be a little bit more appropriate for your middle grade readers or a little bit younger, there is a young adult version of Manhunt as well. That said, for anyone over 13 or 14, if they're into this and they don't mind a little bit of gore and violence, this is definitely a great read. Another book I love to recommend if you just sort of have a general uh, interest in history, you love scandal or whatever, um, I, I have lost the cover to it, but it's Assassination Vacation by Sarah Val. My sister gave this book to me. Um, I love all of Sarah Val's books, but I really love Assassination Vacation. It gets into not just the assassination of Lincoln and Kennedy, who I think get a lot written about them, but also Garfield and McKinley. So the two other presidents in our history who've been assassinated. Um, it's just a really great kind of love letter to history nerds, um, to tour guides, to people who like to know um, a little bit more about history than what might just be in the typical textbook. So um, whenever I get asked for two books, those are two that I definitely like to recommend. I see I am not alone in my love for Manhunt. That's awesome. Um, it's hard. People often want book recommendations uh, with our tours, and it can be tricky because um, we read so much uh, all the time. That's a big part of being a tour guide. And um, sometimes what you read might have good content, but it might not be the most readable uh, occasionally. Uh, so I love these two because they both have great readability. Um, what are you guys reading? Are you guys reading anything good history-wise? <laughs> Excellent. Ooh, this is a really good question from Lori, uh, Lori from Texas. Uh, have you had a chance to do any virtual museum tours? And if so, any you recommend? So right now, a lot of museum and historic sites around the country have been releasing virtual museum tours to try to be more accessible to people during this time where we're being safe, practicing that social distancing, and we have these public sites closed. I have played around a little bit with the virtual tours. I will plug Ford's Theater, one of my favorite historic sites here in DC. They have incredible online resources Courses, some virtual exploration, but really good in-depth look at their collection. 
high res images, 3D images, all of that good stuff. So I would definitely must mention Ford's Theater. I was playing around with the Musée d'Orsay's virtual museum tour the other day, and that was really fun. Um, that's something I wanna dig in more uh, to this week is see what our public sites um, are doing, our historic sites, our museums. Um, this is really tough for them. So when this is over, um, definitely make an effort to go out and support your local museum, your historic site, um, because it's really hard right now not being able to welcome visitors. Oh, uh, Cassie's asking what Cassie Casey. I hope I'm saying Cassie. I hope it's saying it right. Uh, what food do I absolutely have to try in D.C.? Oh, it's going to be a controversial question. So one thing about D.C. is we don't have, I think, like a very homogenous food culture. D.C. is an incredibly diverse city. Um, you can walk down the average uh, street in D.C., uh, especially in the residential neighborhoods, and you might see all kinds of different foods from all around the world. That said, we're close to the water, so we love seafood. I agree with Caitlin on oysters. Oysters are like a must in DC. I love Atlantic um, and Chesapeake Bay oysters. I love like the salty brininess. It's like perfect for me. Um, we love the blue crab, right? A crab cake, anything with crab. Um, Maryland has the stronger claim to the crab. Um, Cassie, okay, perfect. Um, uh, Maryland has a stronger claim to the ca uh, crab, but we love blue crab in DC. Um, we're gonna be coming up soon to that great crabbing season, so I hope we can get out and get some crabs. Uh, I would definitely recommend Ethiopian food. DC has the largest Ethiopian population outside of Africa. We also have a really big Eritrean population in DC. Uh, I had never had um, Ethiopian food until I moved to DC, and I just really love it. Um, you can get a whole variety of Ethiopian and Eritrean food, um, and that's something that I think is special to DC. It's not something you're gonna find in every US city and certainly not as abundant. Um, the half smoke I mentioned earlier, the half smoke is something that people in DC love. A half smoke is a sausage, half pork, half beef, all delicious, usually served um, with a spicy chili, which is how they do it at Ben's Chili Bowl, uh, onions, mustard, maybe cheese. Um, so the half smoke is great. What I love about a half smoke is the snap. The casing gets really crisp, so you get a really good snap on a half smoke. Um, Ben's is most famous, but a lot of places and a lot of butchers in DC will have the half smoke, and I love that. Uh, somebody mentioned, oh, Anne-Marie mentioned mumbo sauce. Mumbo sauce is, oh, it's so good. Um, if you can get like wings with mumbo sauce in DC, that's, I think, a very local thing. Uh, and something that people outside of DC don't always know. So that's something that's a little more more local, uh, draws back to our really rich African-American culture in DC. Uh, our free tours team mentioned cupcakes. We do love cupcakes in DC. We're big on sweets. I am now gonna share with you a tip that everyone should know, but may not already know. The most famous place to get cupcakes in Washington, D.C. is Georgetown Cupcake. Um, they had a TV show. They have a lot of good publicity. They're everywhere. They're very popular and they're fine. If Georgetown Cupcakes wants to send me, um, you know, a dozen cupcakes, I'll eat them. But sorry, Georgetown Cupcake. My favorite cupcakes are actually from Baked and Wired. Baked and Wired is a local bakery in uh, Georgetown. It's incredible. Um, not only do they have amazing cupcakes, but they also do something called an OMG bar, which is like s'mores gone wild. So good. Um, I love they do their own homemade Fig Newtons. Um, they have incredible cookies, cakes, everything. So I love Baked and Wired. Um, I'm a big fan of Buttercream Bake Shop. Uh, they have incredible cupcakes right now. I'm just like waiting for them to reopen. Uh, Buttercream Bake Shop though is doing a great promotion now where you can actually call them and you can order up baked goods and they have, they'll have them delivered to our first responders and the medical personnel who are working so hard right now. And I love that Buttercream Bake Shop is so uh, connected to the community. I think that's really cool. Um, if you're a vegan, uh, and I know we've got people who are vegan um, or have sensitivities to certain ingredients, Sticky Fingers is probably your best bet for baked goods and sweets. I eat everything all the time, I eat everything, um, but I even like sticky fingers. Um, I can't tell that it's vegan. I can't tell that it doesn't have eggs or butter or whatever, so very good. Dan brought up a great point. Eat anything Jose Andres. Jose Andres is a restaurateur and chef here in Washington, D.C. Every one of his restaurants is incredible. He also does incredible work in the community. You probably know him from feeding people in Puerto Rico or after um, Hurricane Harvey in Houston. Um, uh, all tropical storm Harvey, I guess technically, um, but all the things um, that he does out in in the community. So uh, Jose Andres is incredible. Uh, of Jose Andres's restaurants, 
My favorite, and I have not had a chance, the pleasure to do mini bar yet, but my favorite is China Chilcano on 7th Street. China Chilcano is sort of close to uh, the Capital One Arena uh, down in the Chinatown area. It's so good. It's like Peruvian Asian fusion. Um, they have dancing yuca, which is fresh hot yuca with like little bits of dancing, dancing meat on them. Uh, they have incredible Pisco Sours. They do a really good happy hour. I'm a huge fan of China Chilcano. Oh, people loved Baked and Wired. I'm making everybody hungry. <laughs> um, oh yeah, Buzz Bakery, they do the 930 Cupcake. So if you go to 930 Club, which is a great local music venue uh, in DC, close to U Street, um, they have incredible cupcakes from Buzz Bakery. Hi, Linda. Uh, I answered one of your questions earlier, Linda, um, about kind of hidden DC history that I love. I mentioned Oak Hill Cemetery and um, Congressional Cemetery. And again, at the end of the chat, I'll go back in and put links into all, almost everything that I've talked about. You guys, we're doing so great. Uh, we're going to do about 10 more minutes. I'm happy to answer, uh, again, any questions you have. I'm going to just reiterate a little bit about what we're trying to do during this time uh, where we're not able to be out leading tours. So we're gonna be doing this chat every Tuesday. It won't just be me, thank goodness. It won't just be guides in DC. We're gonna have guides all across uh, the country, hopefully maybe all across the world uh, doing these <laughs> um, doing these chats. So every Tuesday, 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, log in. We're just going to keep this going um, as long as we can. We also are unveiling our new podcast. Uh, should have asked a tour guide. A lot of behind the scenes info, a lot of uh, kind of scandal stories, ghost stories, darker stories. Um, if you want to have early access to that podcast, to our videos, if you want a chance to get a one on one virtual tour just for you, customized, please support our new Patreon. We'll link to the Patreon in the comments, but the Patreon is a way that we're trying to kind of keep our operations rolling and help support our guides um, as well. Oh, I'm being told. Yes, I, I just got in uh, from our producers that we're also doing this chat on Thursday. So you'll be able to do this chat on Thursday as well. So tour guide Tuesday, tour guide Thursday, tour guide every day in my house, really. <laughs> um, so we've got the we've got the Patreon to support the podcast and the videos. Uh, we're going to be posting videos not just on the main page but on the stories. So um, if you are familiar with the Facebook stories or the Instagram stories, um, we're going to be having a lot of really good um, information um, about some maybe lesser known sites or things you might not notice at some of the more famous sites. Um, anytime we post those videos, we'll also be posting our tour guides Venmo. Uh, that's a chance that if you are inclined and you enjoy what you're seeing, you can send a virtual tip. Um, so it's just a way to show some appreciation to our guides. Um, everything we're putting out here for you guys is free. We want you to have access. But if you're liking it, um, any of our videos will have Venmo info for our guides. And then finally, of course, I mentioned this earlier, but you can always purchase a gift certificate. A gift certificate is good for any premium tour, any future tour in any city. Um, and we have links for that as well. So um, I want to say a big thank you to everybody who's tuned in today. I want to just say a big thank you to everybody who's been watching our videos, supporting what we're doing. Um, we love being part of this community so much. Um, and we miss our guests and we miss um, our, our guide colleagues and we miss being out in the field. So having your support online, virtually, digitally, uh, we really, really, love that and uh, we hope everyone's staying safe uh, out there staying healthy but we're glad that we have a chance to connect so our next um our next thursday uh tour guide is going to be kathleen from new york city thursday march 26th so if you have new york city related questions that's gonna be the person to ask um definitely ask her more about our street art tour because i was obsessed for days after the the tour i took i just couldn't stop looking at all of our amazing photos um but she'll have all the scoop on nyc so let's see, we got about maybe five more minutes or so of me. Oh, thank you, Mel. <laughs> Mel's being so sweet. Uh, any other questions, questions about DC, about that tour guide life, travel questions, anything at all? Um, a very good travel tip for DC, like a general tip, is our weather can be very unpredictable. Um, we definitely have like all four seasons and sometimes in like one day or one week. So I always encourage people, if you're traveling to DC, 
expect rain. Rain is very common. So pack something that is good for rain, rain weather, whether it's a rain coat or a poncho or an umbrella, uh, something you can carry with you. Light layers is always really good in DC because it can be really cold in the morning, really hot in the afternoon, or it can be sweltering all day and you go into a museum and it's freezing. So packing for light layers and being prepared for rain is like my number one travel tip uh, for DC. Mel's asking, where else have I done free tours by foot? tours. Uh, I mentioned this earlier in the video, but I've done tours in New York City um, with our, our free tours by foot team in New York. And I've done tours in London, uh, the incredible Harry Potter tour. That was an amazing tour experience. Uh, really was a fun one. Um, I've also done tours in Boston. Oh my gosh, I can't believe I didn't mention Boston with Brian. Um, <laughs> Brian is incredible. He's got enthusiasm he knows so much about Boston history. Um, so we did a great tour with Brian and another great tour with David. I think it was David. And David. I had to, I had to ask my producer back there. Uh, David. Um, I haven't done our tours in Philly yet. I've got to come up and take a tour with Jen. I'd like to go down to Charleston. I've been dying to do our New Orleans tours. That's like the next thing on my list. And I'd love to come out to LA um, and do tours out there with the LA team. <laughs> Um, excellent. I think maybe one thing I'll mention too uh, towards the end here is what I'm most looking forward to uh, when the city sort of reopens, when we can get back out there. Um, I am most looking forward to um, sharing the city, sharing the city again, um, being able to talk about why I think these places are amazing, why um, I get excited um, at the Capitol building, uh, why I love the Library of Congress, the most beautiful building in the city, uh, to point out um, memorials that people don't always notice. Um, you might see some of these coming up later, but I love the memorials to Grant and Garfield, which are right outside the Capitol building. People walk by them all the time, but they both have incredible stories behind them, uh, very moving stories. Uh, I love getting a chance to, um, talk about silly things or uh, funny things. I love talking about White House pets. I love talking about, um, I don't know, you know, ghost stories, scandal stories. Those things make me happy. So I think uh, when the city reopens, I'm gonna go out, I'm gonna go um, support some of my favorite local businesses, uh, you know, buy some oysters, have some drinks, um, explore the city, and then I'm gonna get back out there and share it. So that's what we're all hoping for. So I think this is going to be the end of our chat. I wanna thank everybody who tuned in. I would list you all by name, but there's so many of you. You guys have been incredible. Thank you so much. Um, we're gonna still be in the comments, so if you watch this video later and you have questions that I didn't address, um, I'll be back in the comments. I'll make sure to answer all your questions. I'll drop some links in the comments as well to cover some of the things we talked about. A lot of the information I mentioned you can find on our website, freetoursbyfoot.com. Uh, if you're already on our Facebook, just make sure you're liking and subscribing so you don't miss any posts. Uh, we do a lot of great content on Instagram and Twitter as well, so you can always follow us there. Our team is also available by email, so shoot us an email, especially if you're a teacher uh, or an educator. We're trying to do the best we can to support everybody during this time. Uh, thank you so much. Stay safe, stay healthy, be kind to each other. Um, don't cancel your trips. Reschedule them for later, and when the city opens back up, we're going to welcome you with open arms. So thank you so much. Have a great afternoon, evening, morning, whichever time zone you're in. Thank you, guys. Bye.